So this is going to be fairly organic. It's fairly informal. But the idea is it, it really does um, help a lot to see other people's examples and to get ideas from them. Sometimes it's also really productive to just come up to the front and share what you have and, and get a little bit of a response and makes you realize how much you've actually done. Um, but we're not going to force anyone. Um, but is there anyone who will go ahead and step up and maybe get things started and share what they have? And we'll all, we'll You're not all supposed say, to force you. I think. We'll all say I mean, yes I don't mind and. Up, but, <laughs> I'll do it for you. <laughs> I mean, I don't mind if you want to. Come on up no, then, no, yeah. No, no, break the ice. Yeah. It. All right, so um, it's. And there's a microphone up top. Oh, yeah. Like many, it's a work in progress. Um, so that's for you. Hi. Is this working? Oh, yeah. Great. Um, OK, so let's click down here. I was the one that gave you free beer. Um, so uh, first off, just uh, so this is so this is just kind of a, a slideshow that I um, started coming up with. Um, it's it was really actually to help me organize myself. Um, uh, this is uh, Lenin's Wall in um, Prague. And um, it the whole story behind it is when so actually I'm going to go ahead and so actually, there's a couple stories. The story behind this project is I was there a couple summers ago, and I met this guy who was just a really sort of lively, um, gregarious, um, outgoing guy. And he wanted to um, help me uh, by creating some videos. So we went around a lot of sort of cool sites in Prague, and he helped me make this video. And so let's just, this is my project reality check. And so we went to this, uh, this wall, and the whole story behind this wall is that when John Lennon died, um, Czechs came and started painting this wall. And I'm going to actually turn down the sound. So here he is, and I'm going to skip a little bit of this. Um, but he's just basically kind of giving a, a background to the students about, about John Lennon, the history of this wall. And so we'll just kind of skip. Um, and I just kind of want to show um, there's a lot of uh, Creative Commons licensed and, and, open, and public domain um, images that are used uh, throughout this video. Um, after he um, finishes describing it, then I will go sort of. There's even some video that um, people had put on YouTube that is under a CC license. So this kind of started with this. Um, and then going through, I found even more video that um, could eventually make its way into the um, into the uh, lesson. But I want to actually go ahead and just go straight to my document, which is right up here. Um, and so the idea was to play with the language that I'm seeing on the wall. Um, it's an international city, and this is a tourist attraction, and there's nothing like traveling and then realizing that you can leave some paint on a wall. So a lot of people um, actually uh, write, uh, as you can see, there's a lot of English. Um, that's actually OK, um, because I think it actually helps getting the juices flowing. Um, when they see uh, English, they kind of start to think about, oh, that's the kind of stuff they're writing in English. Now I can kind of get into that check mode. Um, here, the biggest um, word that you see that's going to come up in a second is laska, which means love. Um, and we're going to come um, back to that in a second. Um, I started here with just a little bit of a reading. I took this from Wikipedia, um, and I edited it slightly um, just to give them some background. It's all in English because I don't want to spend a lot of time um, on, this, uh, on this history. Show them how you've licensed that. This is good practice, what he just did. So underneath of the... The image, he's got the John Lennon wall, which is the title of the image. And then he's got the person, and then he's got the license. Yay. That, that's the way to do it. I've been doing this for a while, by yeah, the way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is four years into a uh, Creative Commons licensed um, curriculum for Czech. So, um, My point is that it's better to put like the, all that information with the image than put it at, at EndNotes. Google uh, Creative Commons just likes you to do that with images. Keep it close to the image. Um, it's easier yeah. to read. So um, I started off with this word, Alaska, and I actually hadn't uh, written this part of the assignment um, yet, but the idea was, and actually the, the next image I was going to put in here is a picture of a blackboard. Um, I like to put those kind of things into my assignment, so it just kind of inspires you. What are you going to do next? And the idea would be to, OK, here's this one word. 
right? Let's work at the lexical level as a kind of a warm up for the class. So what are some words that you could imagine yourself writing on this wall, right? What, what, is, what is John Lennon, the memory of, of him, the memory of, of his music, what does that inspire you to write? Um, and so I can imagine people writing words like, you know, love, peace, truth, I'm sure. Imagine, exactly. Um, and, and, and in fact, all those words are on here, just in, in mostly in English, but <laughs> that's okay. Um, and um, so then I started to kind of look around for check. Um, and when I found check, sometimes the check was maybe something I, I didn't think was all that, that interesting, but, but I found a few um, instances of, of interesting check. Um, this one actually says, John, we believe in you. Um, and it's a, a, a neat kind of construction because it, this doesn't come up very often, um, but it's, it's something that you know, we do believe in things, and so why not be able to uh, maybe kind of practice that construction? It seemed very prominent to me. Um, and so I made a little word cloud um, of things that I immediately thought of, and so I put words, uh, love, beauty, truth, good, people, peace, God, honesty, miracles, right? So what are the kind of things that you could imagine saying that you believe in, right? So we get to suddenly, you know, with this sort of rich context of this wall, and then, okay, I'm going to express myself. It's suddenly much more than, than okay, today we're going to learn how to say believe in and, you know, fill in the blank, right? Let's, you know, um, let's, you know, get the correct accusative forms of all these words, right? I mean, you need that grammar to get this right, but this suddenly puts it into a much richer context. Um, next thing I found, I really liked this. This is a very simple uh, counterfactual conditional. Um, if I had not gotten to know John, I would not know how to love. Um, and so again, getting them to um, come up with something that might be sort of important in their life that they could then say, if I had not, right? And of course you're gonna get like, you know, if I had not overslept yesterday, I would have done better on the test, right? <laughs> That's fine, right? We want them, though, to, to come up with these kinds of, con you know, th th this context is, I think, rich enough to, to get them, get them kind of get the juices flowing. Now, the history behind the wall is that it actually um, was a location where people would write various messages um, during communism um, to each other. They put poetry on the walls. Um, and so this was actually something from 1977. I don't know if this, as far as I can tell, this is not a famous piece of poetry beyond that it was on this wall. Um, I Google quoted it, couldn't find it anywhere. So um, this is actually interesting. I, I've started to wonder about this. I mean, is this copyrighted text? I don't know, but <laughs> there's a picture of it, right? Um, so um, this, uh, so I, was, I was in the middle, I think when, uh, I was in the middle of putting a, um, a citation here, or an attribution rather. Um, but I'll read, go ahead and read the poem to you. Si jako rosa v rani travě, si den, který se zrodil v právě, si slunce, který rano vstává, si svěží měka hebka tráva. So you can hear that rhyme. Travě, právě, vstává, tráva. I'm not sure exactly how I would come up with a rhyming sort of game or getting them to play with that, but um, it could involve them creating their own sort of pseudo poetry. Um, um, again, for all of these activities, just like I had them writing the one word, we're kind of spiraling into more complex, right? And so everything is gonna involve, I like the idea of having a, like this, having a big piece of paper maybe on each of the four walls and they go around and so we start off and we, they see the evolution throughout the day. So by the end, they're putting up some pretty complex stuff. Um, and so, yeah. And then the last thing is this um, somewhat very cheesy um, love poem. Uh, I won't read it to you in Czech, but I'll go ahead and translate it. Um, Hi, Teresa, uh, you my most beloved uh, love, I want to caress you, kiss you, hold you in my embrace. When I um, take a sniff of, it's, I, it's not very good uh, English translation of poetry. When I take a sniff of your hair, that doesn't sound. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds worse, right? Anyway, so moving on, right? So um, 
I will, apparently that sniff of her hair is going to help him to change the entire world by love, transform it um, into a beautiful garden that is sweet um, uh, with um, honey, um, uh, soft uh, like um, uh, moss and uh, guiltless uh, like a flower. My heart uh, beats and beats, bump, ba bump, ba bump, only especially to, to, to approach your velvety lips. I love you, Andra. Okay, so then we can get them to make their own sort of expressions of hopefully some sort of positive emotion, love. Um, and so that's where I am. I, it's not a completed assignment, as I said, but that's, that's what I've got. And if you have any comments, questions, or just want to hear from somebody else, then I am. My comment is that you, uh, I think this is a brilliant place to start. I, um, I love how the, the words and the images are going together here. Yeah. I mean, it's such a great example of linguist, uh, linguistic landscape and multimodality. Um, and I like how you're, you're in a way, the, the whole notion of redesign is there because you're taking parts of it and then using them as prompts for people to do other things with it. So yeah, I think this is absolutely right on target for flight. Um, I, lo I, just add that I love that the redesign actually then becomes a wall. Yeah. I'm yeah. stealing that to do something with the Berlin <laughs> wall, but it, because then you get that layering over. No, we voices, should be we should be building are, a certain type of wall in our classroom. That's not. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I think as a response to the Berlin yes, wall. Yes, yes. <laughs> Yeah. Inspire yeah. different yeah. inspire yeah. different types That's of right walls. at the end. <laughs> there you go. Right. I don't you don't want them to spray paint it on the on No, the walls, no, but. no. But markers and, and paper are good. Right. Washable. Right. Yeah. I just had a comment that uh, you could also talk about the visual of like the colors and the spray paint and you could potentially pull something in with that and that how that adds meaning to the sort of like freedom aspect that you're just like painting on a wall, it's very public. It's also not something we typically do in like daily recreational activities, but it's like got more of that graffiti feel. Yeah. Yeah, no, exactly. And I um I even got so one of the one of the I love it. It's a hippie concert right in front of it. Um but there's people actually painting. And so I like that as an inspiration. Even having that like taking that video and looping it while they're, so they can just kind of see, like, this is what it's like, you know, you're, you're painting on that wall. Um, so, yeah. Well, and also they know, the people who are painting, they know that it will be ephemeral, because you were talking about how it gets. Right. Yeah, but I'm going to keep those papers. So. <laughs> but that uh, invokes a desire to express something that's maybe different than if it's going to stand for all time. Mm -hmm. So there's that that maybe right. that spontaneity or that, you know, that freeing. Like, exactly, yeah. Cool. All right, Yay. thank you. Yeah. Hi. Oh. Is it on? Yeah. It's on. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> um, I'm Kelly. I'm a PhD student here at UT in the Department of Middle Eastern Studies, and I teach Persian, so I have a lesson. It's in Persian, but I will translate it for you. Um, do. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> if you want a crash course. <laughs> um, so yesterday I had these big thoughts of doing something about like getting around Tehran and using maps and things, but it wasn't working, so I scrapped that. And instead I picked a poem um, by Foruge Farokhzad, who was a very famous, uh, well-known woman Iranian poet who unfortunately died very young in her 30s. She was famous for being sort of depressive, lonely. Um, but I don't want to give the students that context before giving them the poem, so it's not like clouded by that knowledge. Um, so the poem that I picked is called Gift. Here's the Persian, but I'll show you the English. It's very short. Um, can you see that okay? Yeah, okay. It's about six lines long, um, and I'm Really happy I found it because in second semester of first year, the students will know almost all of these words. So they'll be able to deal with it in Persian, sort of authentically, um, before I give them the English translation. They'll be able to work with it some. Um, so let's see. So it's called Gift. And 
I decided to start with a little warm-up activity where I will ask the class, you know, talk with your partner for three to five minutes about the last time that someone gave you a gift. What was it like? What gift did you get? What was the occasion? How did it make you feel? Do you still have that gift? Do you use it? Um, when do we usually give each other gifts, right? We're thinking about birthdays or Mother's Day or Christmas or in Iran, Nuruz, the New Year is a really, really important holiday where you might exchange gifts with someone. Um, so just getting them to think about the word gift and then make predictions about the text that they're going to read based on their own experiences and assumptions. So do you think, what do you think the subject of this poem will be if it's called gift? Uh, and then from that, oops. I'll give them the poem in Persian, and they'll work by themselves for a few minutes, reading it. Um, let's see. Oh, OK. So they don't know that it's a poem yet. So I've given it to them. They'll read it to themselves, and then I'll ask, OK, what kind of text is this? They'll probably say poem, and then I'll ask, you know, OK, why? Why do you think this is a poem? What about it says poem to you? Um, and then I'd like them to determine, OK, is this a classical Persian poem? Is this a modern Persian poem? How do you know? What about the structure or the theme or the content tells you, tells you that? Um, and one thing I would like to point to for them is the spelling convention here shows me that it was not written in the last like 20 years. Um, because today we would separate the me from the zanam, harf mi zanam. Um, so that's just a little spelling convention that they'll need to learn to recognize when they're reading texts in the future. And that gives them a hint about when it was written and how old it is. Um, okay, so that's the first reading that they do by themselves. Uh, when was it written? Yeah, okay. So then uh, the second reading I'd like them to do with a partner. So with whoever's next to them, they'll read together. Um, and this time I want them to pay attention to the sounds of the poem. So what sounds or words are repeated? Um, we have some repeated words in the first little stanza, right? I speak out of the deep of night, out of the deep of darkness, out of the deep of night I speak. There's a lot of repetition there. Um, but then in the second stanza we don't have as much, so there's a little bit of a difference there. So thinking about what's being repeated. Hmm? Oh, in Persian? Okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, man as nahayat shab harf mizanam, man as nahayat tariki, va as nahayat shab harf mizanam. Yeah. <laughs> so, it rhymes a little bit. Yeah, it's really nice. Um, so, they'll think about what's repeated, and then what else did I say? Oh, okay. And then um, what sounds or words or phrases kind of stand out to you? Does anything sound weird or strange or, you know, deviate from what you might expect? Um, and then... <laughs> oh, okay. And then um, what did you feel when you were reading the poem? What sort of feeling did it give to you? What was your personal experience with this poem on just like a pure observational level, right? So we're starting with the personal and then we'll grow into bigger uh, observations. So once we've done that, I like to put them in slightly bigger groups when they're talking about bigger picture things, bigger questions, so three to four people maybe. Um, and here is when I'll give them the English translation, although I'm open to suggestions and criticisms about this. I'm not 100% sure. So I'm thinking I'll give them the English translation here for reading in a slightly bigger group. And this is when I will ask them the bigger question. So who is the speaker? Who are they speaking to? Um, what is the mood of the poem? And finally, the sort of bigger question is, what is the meaning of the title? Why is this poem, oh, right, I speak out of the deep of night, out of the deep of darkness, and out of the deep of night I speak. If you come to my house, friend, bring me a lamp and a window I can look through at the crowd in the happy alley. Why is it titled Gift? What does that have to do with the content of the poem? What does that mean? And does that conform to your expectations or assumptions about what you thought the content of the poem would be based on the title alone, right? Um, there's a big difference that I see there. And then, finally, um, for the last activity, I'm thinking, um, I'll give them the poem, but I've taken certain words and phrases out of it. And now on their own, they have to 
refill those blanks with words or phrases of their choosing, so they're completely changing the meaning of the poem. Um, so it becomes sort of their own creation. It teaches them about um, poetic interpretation and manipulation of words and sounds. Um, but yeah, that's mainly it. Um, I'd love suggestions or comments, so thank you. Oh yeah, the well, I was I was actually inspired by a lesson that's already on the flight website. It's the Chinese one about the hungry, hungry caterpillar. I noticed that they did the same thing where they took out certain words and then gave it back to the students to fill in on their own. I was like, that's smart. <laughs> I want to do that. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. and, and can I just note something from that lesson that I noticed you're doing here? Mm -hmm. It's not a, a typical sort of hey, do you remember what the poem is supposed to be, right? It's a how do you when you change these words, how do you create a new poem mm -hmm. with a similar sort of structure, which really focuses on the meaning and, and not just the have you got it right? I think that's a really productive activity. Yeah. Another mm -hmm. thing to to tie that into your question of of a, offering a translation, mm -hmm. it can be interesting if you find two translations. Um, and I then did see actually, and what kind different. of differences <laughs> yes. there are and how that, I mean, that, that can be a prelude, if you wish, to then having them change the meaning of the poem by using uh, other words. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's a really good so point. So it's not actually, just giving them, oh, here is the translation, and then locking people into, the, oh, this is what this poem means, and uh, opening them up to the fact that people are going to translate things differently. Mm -hmm. yeah. Have you thought about integrating gift giving practices? Oh no. Yeah. Yeah, I that's a really good say. idea. So yeah. Get at the rich points, right? And that's good because the new year, Noruz, is in the middle of March, and that's like the middle of second semester of first year. Uh, so that could be a good because cultural occasion. Because I was thinking the same thing. The word gift and then the translation mm -hmm. yeah. is mm -hmm. already set, brings in the cultural baggage right, right from the right. beginning. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, Americans are going to think of birthday presents and Christmas gifts. And no, this is a completely different cultural framework. So I think it could be interesting. One thing you could do is ask to, um, Persian speakers to associate and create a word cloud okay. and then have your students do the same and can do a comparison yeah, of the right. word clouds. Yeah. That's, that's really that's cool. That's actually very yeah. doable and you could use that uh, in the lesson. I think that'd be yeah. pretty cool. That's a really cool idea, yeah. yeah. You were, Thank you. Oh. It was uh, from the very beginning to the end. I just checked her <laughs> presentation. It was wonderful. We both speak uh, Farsi and mm -hmm. English. Yeah. And the way that she had arranged the work, I mean, presentation or lesson plan was wonderful, the, uh, especially the last activity. Mm -hmm. The time that we both checked the translation that is done by a kind of famous professor in one of the universities in Minnesota. Uh, UCLA, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So we just both agreed that only the two lines of the end of the poem are mm -hmm. translated in a good way. Yeah. All the other four lines didn't make sense to us. Ah. <laughs> so that is a good idea to ask the students to rewrite a translation again, as yes. the professor mm -hmm. mentioned. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I've, that's great. I've done that with some things. And the students, um, again, it's this notion of moving back and forth between the, the two languages, which kind of raises to their uh, awareness that it's so hard meaning just changes from the two different uh, spaces. Yeah. But yeah, it's like this is an old concept of translation that we're kind of rediscovering in multiliteracies, because it used to be no, every stay in the language, but this you have to have the two languages together to see mm -hmm. how the meaning changes. So, yeah, actually, yeah. the time that we were comparing both kind of texts, I took a photo of the English one and just I said, "Can you just show the Persian one?" But the time that we checked and kind of they were, they were quite different. Yeah. So one thing that I've used yeah. in, in doing a translation activity is to say everybody talks about what's lost in translation, mm -hmm. but there's also stuff that is gained. So you can talk about what is there in the English translation that's not there in the original. And then I actually had a student who said, oh, there's a, there's a third category. There's kind of what stays the same. Because like the literal, sometimes there's just, uh, you know, a bottle is a bottle in both cultures, and it's right. okay. So I thought those three categories, yeah. like what changes, what's the same, and what's kind of new, mm -hmm. is kind of is very helpful. Yeah, in the English translation, they added the word friend. It's not there in Persian. And then I saw a different English translation, and they added the word darling, which is not there. But 
I darling. Well, there there is no word. So they're they're trying to emphasize that they're speaking to um, a familiar you. They're speaking to to not shoma, which you can see in the conjugation of the verb, um, which is something I'll have the students look at. You know, asking like, okay, who are they talking to? How do you know that they're talking to someone yeah. close to them? Perfect. Right. That was kind of difficult to find mm -hmm. something that we call daddy chain Farsi. And even the native speaker, she couldn't find a word for that stuff. What is the thing that is smaller, maybe from window, a kind of maybe passage that you can see the beyond the stuff? I don't know if you have it for English or not. Like a really uh, small window. Oh. Yeah. We have yeah. it in <laughs> Kurdish. And we would say a really small window. Yeah, exactly. That's what I said. <laughs> a small so window. Maybe we, can, maybe we can take it from Farsi. Yeah. Vit? How small? Or, um, no, I don't know. There is a term. I can't think of it right now. Yeah, a no, people. No, but it no? it's bigger. In Iraqi Arabic, we have a word, razune. Mm -hmm. I'm sure this razune. is not Arabic. So yeah. it's either uh, Turkish or Persian. Mm. Mm. It means like a s very small window you can look through. Uh huh. It's not like the regular windows. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like a portal? Maybe a portal. Yeah, no, we'll there's like there's another term. Yeah. Probably. Porthole, yeah. yeah port uh, how long is your lesson? Um, so this would be for about a 50 minute class period. Uh, how long like time is time for practicing? For, for what? For practicing. Practicing, yeah. meaning? Meaning like uh, away from presentation, you're gonna present your, your lesson and the time assigned for a practicing with your students. Um, how long would it, I see. How, what do you do versus the, the practical, oh, what the am practical I doing? part of your lesson? Right, so most of the class time is the students working. Um, so I'm just introducing questions to them and then putting them in small groups and saying, So it's Go. primarily like student-centered, like all Yeah, yeah, all absolutely. Great. Yeah, getting the students to be reading and speaking as much as possible in class and interacting mm -hmm. with each other. Yeah, oh, and then I didn't mention, but at the end I want sort of like a big group discussion where I kind uh -huh. of call on the smaller groups, say, okay, what did you talk about in terms of the meaning of the poem? What did you talk about? And I don't like to limit those discussions. I kind of let them go on as long uh -huh. as the students want to talk mm -hmm. about the poem. Um, mm -hmm. And since it's second semester, first year, and we're talking about the meaning of a poem, if there's something they really want to say that they can't say in Persian, I'll let them say it in English, because it can be frustrating to not be able to express abstract ideas um, at that level. Mm -hmm. oh, so I'm okay with that, All right. you know, yeah. once All in right. a while. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> yeah, nice. Okay, so nothing special, <laughs> just the text written in black on white. Um, so, but why I chose this text? Because um, this person, uh, she's 11 years old and she's describing uh, her attitude towards family. So, and what family means to her. And what she says here, she says that uh, she was abandoned by her mom and her grandma uh, brought her up, but her grandma died and she was alone. And um, she also describes uh, how important for her um, it was to have uh, like love, that the only thing that she wanted from her mom was love. So, and her new family, she was adopted after that, after the death of her grandma. And her new family is very lovable. And she says that she believes that um, happy family are possible and happy families, they exist. Uh, and for her, what happy family means, it's just mother, father who love her. So, and um, I planned a lesson for uh, intermediate Russian students because uh, for my lesson, I decided that, you know, um, uh, so it's, um, what? No, 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 we're very impressed. It's like you're already using this template. And we, we got thought, excited. We <laughs> forgot that we didn't show you the template, but you're already using it. It's good, it's good, yay. <laughs> Yeah, but you forgot about my partner. So he's been with you for five years. So of oh, course I'm using this. Stuff. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Okay, so, and uh, usually when uh, people present like topic about families, we kind of, we are all familiar with family trees and everything. And I kind of think that I decided to kind of broaden it a little bit, yes. And not to talk just simply that this is a father of my father and this is a mother of my mother, but just uh, uh, started talking about what family means in your life. But of course, since we uh, discussed yesterday, about fam familiar text, I decided to begin my lesson with actually like any family tree, but why? In order to review uh, family vocabulary, because uh, uh, anyway she uses, yes, the words such as priomne, mama, it's like adopted mom and uh, grandma and father and everything. So the students need to review the uh, words. So after that, um, uh, or actually before that I planned. Um, so before that, yes, I decided to begin my lesson with just discussing um, what basic needs students have, trying to elicit in probably the word family. So, and if somebody says that family is important for them, then that after that I wanted to brainstorm the ideas, what actually they associate, uh, what words they associate with the uh, word family, and again, because I understand that for some students it can be something good, yes, and for some students it can be like a touchy subject or something painful. Uh, so, and uh, so after that, reviewing the vocabulary with family tree, and after that, uh, reading the text. So together, and also what I loved about that text that the text uh, first very simple grammar, very simple vocabulary, because it's eleven year uh, old student. Yes, but at the same time, it's narrative, but it's authentic and it's full of dative case. And uh, we need to cover the dative case with intermediate Russian students. And the book that we are we have to use at our department, the book covers dative case in the topic of family. So that's why the text kind of worked perfectly for me. And what what I was thinking is uh, so to read the text to. Um, uh, point out very important um, phrases, yes, and also like maybe grammar, because like some phrases like family is important because it gives people warmth, cousiness, and love, yes, just helps students maybe to translate some words if they don't know them. So, and after that, uh, talk with students what emotions, yes, this text uh, evokes um, in them, because I believe that it's like sadness in first, because it's like really touchy and happiness at the end. Yes, because she actually found happiness so with her new family. So, and after that, um, maybe practicing uh, some um, phrases with them. Yes, asking them questions, what family means for them or so that they could use some phrases from the text in order actually to practice the vocabulary and practice the uh, grammar forms. So, and um, after that, um, just a sec, what did I da, 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 answer questions? Okay, so, and after that I thought that after we practice grammar forms with them and practice the vocabulary and phrases, they could probably write their own perspective on what family means in their life. And also in order to maybe uh, give some options for students who, uh, like for whom it's very touchy, I thought that maybe they could describe a family of their dream if they don't want to write about their own family. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. <coughs> nice. Can, can I share something? And you tell me if I got it wrong, because uh, I don't speak Russian. But when we were talking about this yesterday, um, one thing you pointed out to me about the dative in Russian is that it's used in these expressions of want and desire. Yes, um, and yes. So that's, I need family, yeah, I, yeah. And, and also the sound play, because this text, yes, it doesn't have a lot of deviations or is it this extraordinary patterns and everything, but at the same time, the sound play, because it's always new family, new family, new family, yeah. new family, and I need new, like, I need love, I need family, because, yes, this is dative, and I yeah. think that this sound play 
if student like underline all the words they they just see it. The, so yeah. the, the reason I wanted to mention that is because I think this is a really nice example of where it's not just this text has the dative. Hey guys, look, here's the dative. Remember how we showed you that? Here's what it looks like again. But the dative and the way you describe the text to me is really part of the message structure of the text. And yes. so that's this content um, and and grammar coming together, not being two separate things, but really the the feeling of the text is conveyed yes. through that dative. And, and also, Russian. it's so um, also it's like you know it works perfectly because in Russian it's also about the um, when we say our age. So, like, you can see the number 11, yes, it's dative. Mm -hmm. When we say who we have, like parents, grandparents, or what their names, we also use dative. So it's, it's kind of really perfect text for uh, presenting dative to students mm -hmm. in uh, the context of family. And also about the copyright, this is what I asked, yes, this morning, because this is how I prepared this text, so when I brought it here, so for my student, because I actually, um, I didn't take the whole essay, because it is very, very long, and because I finished it at the point when she said that she's very happy, but after that she started describing much more of her new life. So, and we discussed it, and it's kind of, it's less maybe than one third of the essay, and we decided that it will be probably all right, uh, that um, I'm not breaking the copyright here, even though, so we have this letter scene here, so. I, I, this reminds me, I, have a, I had a student who um, teaches French in a high school, and she did a, uni she did a lesson on families, too. And I don't remember her original text, but her redesign, the, the task, the, very, the final task of the, the lesson was they had to write, as you were saying, they had to write a description about wh what, what was meaningful about their family, why they loved their family. But she had them write it, uh, not typing it, but in hand, handwriting, and she had them write it as a card. And the cards, and she said, I want you to send it to your family. So she, they actually did it in class, and then they, she yeah, took them to the good. post office and sent them back to their families, and it arrived, and then what she did is they, she said, okay, your family's gonna receive this, and you're gonna have to translate it back into English to your family, which I thought was a great yeah. idea. Yeah, that's awesome, and it, it reminded me, I don't know if it's a, bit, it's a bit off topic, yes, but that's what I did with my students a few classes ago, because I asked them how often they uh, give flowers to their moms or to their girlfriends, and they said, uh, never, or like <laughs> once a year maybe when it's a Mother's Day, and I'm like, but in Russia, yes, it's an absolutely different culture. In in my culture, like men, they always give flowers like to women, and we kind of it's like it's so offensive that they don't give flowers. And one of so yes, and I brought them like ten poems written in Russian, uh, which which uh, which are called uh, "Give uh, Women Flowers," because yeah. you can have pl plenty of them online. But two of my students forgot about their oral exam. Can you imagine that? and they didn't come. So they came to class and I was like, okay guys, I came up with a punishment for you, for like for your bad memory. And they're like, yes, and what is it? Today, after class, you go to the store, <laughs> you buy a bouquet of flowers and you give them to them, and like to your moms. So oh. I don't know if they did it, but I hope they did. <laughs> so. Yeah, sometimes it's, it really works, but they were so scared. Oh, punishment, what punishment? And they're like, yeah, just go and buy flowers to your mom. So. Hey, hey. Hey. Howdy. I had to say it. Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, okay, so I, my, language, uh, my language focus is Spanish. Can I see anyone who works with Spanish here? Okay, we have a few of, of y'all that work with um, Spanish. And so I'm gonna, it's a work in progress. So for all of y'all who just pretty much have an outline, this is perfect, because that's pretty much what I have. And I'm just gonna go through this outline really quickly and tell you what my vision is, okay? Now, um, let me click right here and then, 
Um, so this comes from, this actually comes from my available design that I had is actually a work that I did with um, Dr. Zapata on a lesson that we worked on to teach the differences between poor and para. So the resource is right there already for you. And we pretty much introduce. We also have um, an open educational resource when it comes to the Spanish grammar rules that are very detailed and have some um, little quick examples, just an FYI on all of those. And um, um, and so this was the poor and para, and they had to listen to a song, and then they had to write some lyrics using the differences between the poor and the para, right? And it was a quick 50 minutes um, poor and para lesson. But I did realize when I taught this um, course and I taught this um, lesson specifically, the students were way much more interested in the differences between poor and para. They really wanted to learn more, and they were very engaged. So this is why I decided for my project here, in the workshop to redesign this um, this lesson and take it to the next level so that it could um, have more focus for the students and see what we're working with, right? Now, let me show you my outline. Now, some of the materials that you're gonna see here, the materials that you're gonna have here for this um, outline for the new Port Empara Avanzado per se, we still have this song and this song it's about, it's this guy last time, I checked this song was in fact um the song was in fact Creative Commons. It had um open licensing, but I couldn't find it right now to give it open licensing um attributions. But the the guy is just talking pretty much about his mom. And so he's just pretty much there on and singing. And then, um, so what we're gonna do next, the next two materials, I have the Por Emparati. And this is actually text from my classroom that, from students who I taught last fall and their students. And this is um, their, their raw um, lyrics. I did not edit them whatsoever because it's as authentic as any other work in the Spanish language. So yes, there might be some grammatical mistakes, but it is what it is, and it's it's authentic. I don't know, and um, and so that's what we have now for the introduction, which I actually did complete it. It's at the very top, and I'll show you. Um, the students, uh, we're we're gonna start with the whole concept of um, what is por empara. Do you know anything about por empara, and um, what can you tell me about it? And if you don't know anything, then that's that's okay. And then I give you two sentences, right? Describing por and para and based on university. So vamos para la clase. Estuvo en Texas por dos meses. And so can you tell me why they use um, por and para? And then I give them, I give them the link to the to the grammar in case they need that extra, extra help. And then, antes de leer, vamos a escuchar, ¿verdad? Porque tenemos este video. We have this song, and this song is gonna, it's gonna introduce and it's gonna close the whole, the whole lesson. And then um, we're gonna listen to the song, and I still want them to know, to pay attention, and to tell me their differences. Why did the, why, why did the author use por and para? And I give them specific times in which they go and they look at the sentence because it is a lyric song and the song doesn't have, it's, this is not like a major artist in Spain, it's just a guy who sings and puts it on YouTube, so there's not an actual lyric, like written lyrics is just a lyric video. So I, go, so I tell them to go back to this, um, to this time since, and describe to me based on the rules why they're using each. And then we we go through this whole discussion, and we and we talk about the rules and the reasons why they use the por empara. And then we start the next one, right? The next section it's vamos it's um a escribir vamos a vamos a leer actually vamos a leer. And then we go on and we read the two um, lyrics that you have over here at the bottom from these two students, and we start having more of this conceptualization and analyzation of of the of the lyrics and start asking ourselves, why did the students use por? Why did the students use para, right? And I know some of us um, heritage speakers, some of us who have a lot of experience with Spanish may have some debatable questions as to why that student put, put por when it should be para or et cetera. But then we need to think of the author. Why did the author chose por or para based on the rules that they're learning? 
So then you can have this whole discussion with your classroom and say how it's work and then to say, well, are you really wrong because you use por or para? You know, and so then you can create this whole discussion and just so that we can, the student can be focusing on what it's gonna, what's coming up. Then after this, we're going to escribir, right? And in my peer review, uh, my feedback was really good. And then, um, and then the feedback they gave me is, give them certain themes. So I'm gonna give you a theme of queso, right? Everyone knows about queso. And so I'm gonna, we're gonna do a T-chart, which is another feedback that, we, that I had also. And we're gonna put pour and para on this T-chart. And then I just, write, I just want you to write down you know, kind of start doing an outline of this lyric about, about queso, right? And once you create this outline for queso, then you start creating your lyrics, the lyric of your rap, of your song about queso, using por and para, kind of um, basing it on, on, the, on the writing that you have from actual students who took your course a semester a year before and the song from a singer who, had, who has had it beforehand. And so we have that, and then we create this, um, this environment of collaboration by doing some peer review and having the students pair up or getting groups and start analyzing those new lyrics that they are creating based on the things that we give them, right? And then finally, once we have done all that process, you can already see that the students have been exposed multiple times on the differences between the por and the para. Then we have more of this presentation on moral communication, and we invite students to come and actually rap their songs in front of the class about por and para and queso. And that's pretty much how we conclude this whole this whole um, vision that I'm not done, but I definitely have outlined there for you. Okay, thank you. Comments, questions, feedback? I'm sorry, I'm not a Spanish speaker. Can you explain to me what, what is poor and par, the it's distinction? Like, and it's like the four in English. Right, okay, that's what I figured. Right? But what, mm -hmm. so yes. when do you use when? When it's, um, what is for, for like, um, what is it, emotion? You had two good examples yeah. for me yeah. yesterday, although yeah. I won't be able to do the Spanish. What I remember is your example was, tell me if I'm going to wrong, para was if you're handing me the cell phone, uh -huh. I have the cell phone para ti, uh -huh. right? For the, for, for the benefit of you, like right? And Okay? And yeah. pour, let's see, let's see if we're, we're taking this. <laughs> and pour, pour, your example was my heart is burning for you, where it's the, the poor is the motivating thing, right? The, okay. Uh -huh. and, and so it often gets taught in like a structural way, like para plus an infinitive, things yeah. like that. And there's another way, but it's hard to get at these like semantic so big differences because yeah. it kind of breaks down. And as a learner of Spanish, mm -hmm. this is really, I don't know, I can't remember. Well, I think so much of it goes back to the fact that in English it all translates to the same word. Yes, yes. yes. sure, sure, yes. sure. Like it's not, yeah. like conceptually, semantically, they're distinct, yeah. but yeah. because in English it comes back to the same word, right. that's where the distinction comes in. So what about doing something with images? Because it, since it's conceptual grammar, yeah. I'm wondering if you could even have the students, um, as they're writing about, because it's queso that they're going to be writing. Well, that would be <laughs> fun, I love right? this. Yeah. yeah, that is so fun. Um, maybe have images that are part of it, or even the, the original text, right? They could, uh, maybe they could illustrate parts of the original text or something to get at that visualization. Because one of the, I, I think, again, and I don't speak Spanish either, so tell me if I'm going to get wrong, but the song plays with the close semantic relationship between those two, mm -hmm. right? That they're both yeah. there in the title and that it moves between them. Yes. Um, and just to Carl's point, when you showed me that textbook example, it's one, it's one of those grammar points where yeah. it, there was like an entire page with 20 bullet points. And I thought, oh, as a learner, I'm supposed to memorize <laughs> these bullet points. But here it plays with the concepts. Well, and, and I'm thinking even yeah. just like when you were explaining the distinction to me, it's uh, you were gesturing, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. is, is there any gesturing that happens in the, the video to the song? Yes, that, actually that you could, oh, yeah. And you know, I haven't thought about um, gesturing, but that's definitely one point that I would kind of like foster, especially if I have the students coming in and they're kind of like, you know what I mean? If they really get yeah. into the lyrics that yeah. they're that they're talking about, then they can really give us this. Yeah, because it's not. You probably don't want static images for this. You actually want mm -hmm. some sort of yeah, movement. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. it could even be play acting you do in the yeah. classroom right. to get them to understand conceptually. Something yeah. prop. 
I'm so, excited to learn Spanish. Yeah. So yeah. One, of the, one of the underlying mechanisms, and I'm, I'm, I'm too tired to think of the word right now, but it has to do with notions of proximity and distance. I can't think of the linguistic term for this. But often native, huh? It doesn't matter. Often <laughs> native users will often uh, use in non-canonical ways because it depends on their, um, their conceptualization, their construal. So if they're thinking of, of presence and being here, then, then you know, when you talk about things that involve movement from one place to another, so a lot of locatives and prepositions evoke these kinds of differences of usage depending on what the mental starting point is. And I'm not being able to explain this right now because I'm too tired. No. But in any event, it might be interesting to see if, there, if you can find examples of native users who are not using por and para in canonical ways, and you might start Which to see that patterning. She has that with the non-native speakers, in the, right? So yeah. Right, but you're, but you're saying non-native users. But if you can also find that with native users, it starts to then give credence to the fact that um, there's, there's, another, <laughs> there's another level of mechanism that's going on in terms of cognitive categorization. And depending on what you're, what, where you're thinking as the um, point of departure and where is the point of arrival that you're going to, you know, I yeah. don't know if I'm making any I sense right now. One of the things that I can do that, I could even go further and um, analyze deeper the lyrics of the song yeah. and then see, and then even even see if I can play with a porn pot and change it. There right. you go, and there you go. Exactly, there you exactly. Go. That would be like, how would you feel if this, if he would wrap it with bada instead of poor? And see how the student plays with it, right? Okay. We right. had the discussion with one of my one of the peer reviewers that I had earlier today, and in that discussion, we were having they were like, "Well, it should be poor in one of them, right?" In in one of them, we're like, and then it's like, "Oh, it should be poor here, it should be poor here." But then we were also talking about like, "Well, it really depends, like where your Spanish is coming from, where you grew up with the Spanish." So that poor and para difference can can um can really. So, make a big impact, which is why I like the fact that we can have that kind of discussion with this L2 learners and say like, okay, you know, what is the reasoning as to you as to you using either or? Well, in, in that like in that second text, the yo haría todo para ti. Mm -hmm. like exactly. The meaning, you could use either one there. Yeah. Right? Okay. Right. Meaning, meaning changes. Changes. Yeah. So yeah. is it so dixis is the word I was trying right. to think of, right? So so is it is it a question sometimes of mental representation of of where you're projecting from? Um, I mean. Uh, I'm, I'm throwing that out there because I'm, I'm not sure that it patterns out in this way. I know that there are examples in English and in French where that's the case, and often with locatives, that's the case. So um, it's not as simple as close and far, is right? There? Yeah. It's how so, you're construing it. I, I want to say that this is, um, you know, earlier today, Joanna said, I want, I want to take issue with what Carl said about <laughs> communicative language <laughs> teaching. Yes, and I joke, yes. I said, oh, no, I misspoke. So the, the point is that a lot of texts are just used to exemplify the grammar point again and again and again. You're doing grammar play in a right. flight kind of a way. You're mm -hmm. taking a grammar point, but you're playing with it and within a text because the text is playing with it. And that then teaches them what the rules are and how to play the rules. So that's, this is a great example of what we were getting at. So yay. <laughs> and um, I've also cited the um, I've also cited the two little um, um, lyric um, poems for for my students. All the citations are over here at the bottom. If you wish to use those for examples in your classroom or anything else, and so pretty much everything here is already cited. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs>
And the objective is to enable students to identify and produce pronouns um, in terms of positions and functions. That is subjects pronouns and object pronouns. Uh, so skills is writing and target is pronouns, object and subject. And the strategy that we're gonna follow is PW, peer work, and GW that is group working. And the material is George Michaels. We can use pictures of George Michaels and the lyric itself. Um, the handouts that will be submitted to the students to do the practical part. And it is divided as follows. Five minutes are assigned to warming up, like we can play the song. So this is to get students like in touch, like to get their motivation to the lesson. Um, procedures, we're gonna play the song and the students will listen alone. Like they're, they're not gonna work in pairs. Like it's like one to one, like between the song and the, the students themselves. And then we have 10 minutes for pair work and group work interactions. Like students are gonna be divided into groups and they're gonna like discuss what they understand from the lyric. And that is reading the lyric and underlining the pronouns. And then they have five minutes like to work with larger groups uh, to, check their, uh, to check their answers, to make sure they agree on the same answers. And finally, we have here comes the production part of the of the lesson, which is divided to using like you can add more pronouns to the to the lyric, or you can substitute nouns by other pronouns in terms of subject um, uh, subject object pronouns. And finally, here comes the teachers part, which is like like t giving feedbacks to the students, like to make sure they all comprehend the lesson totally. Yeah, and here is the sag. And uh, we like we play the song first, like just to make sure like they understand the lesson carefully. Mm -hmm. That's it. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So I don't, I didn't understand the last what you were saying about pronouns, you wanted them to replace pronouns with a noun? It's like you can, you can deal it with different way. Like the way we're gonna like use, we can replace that. There are certain pronouns that are omitted in the, in the, in the poem. So they need to uh, employ the, to use the pronouns in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the poem. Could you like bring that back up, the text? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's why I didn't, I didn't have the text in front of me. I, I like that idea uh, now and that I understand it better. Yeah. So uh, we have like uh, grammar play, pragmatic, and uh, repetition of words. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. So now I understand because you yeah. said like presuppositions. This is stuff that they already know. So it has a very different feel if I supply information that, or, you know, if, if, if it's presupposed and I know that you know, I don't say it. Uh -huh. But if I put it in, that has a very different yeah, yeah. feel pragmatically. Uh -huh. So that's really a clever idea. I, 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 yeah. I, I like that. I didn't understand it at all at first, but now I do. And it's a great way of teaching presupposition and why you might w not want to say things mm -hmm. because it's given. And if you say things, that um, then it shows that I don't really trust you to understand it. I mean, it's great. It's great. And, and one more reason for choosing this song is that every, everyone in my country loves this song. Like, it's really <laughs> famous and popular. So students will get crazy, like, to know that their lesson will be about this song. No. And secondly, like, like, protecting myself from copywriting, because, like, you can use these songs however you like. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So where would the pronouns come up? Like, yeah. So should have like known subject, better than to Subject, cheat object, friend. pronouns. Like, they can, first they underline, okay, and they recognize the positions and the uses. And here comes the, then comes the production part. They can substitute nouns with pronouns, and, or they can like use their own sentences using the same pronouns in the poem. So do you mean at the beginning of the third stanza, it, you, they would write in I should have known better because the I is missing? Is that the kind of thing yeah. you're? Yeah, like yeah. that. We're helping students to pass the test, usually with the IELTS and TOEFL. So normally we start a, a, sub, a, a sentence with I or a noun. Mm -hmm. So this is the, the purpose of the lesson. So then the Yeah, like words. here we're dealing with like spoken English, and it's normal like we omit and and to make it short. But with standard written English, like we need a subject of very complement. There might be something more than just the distinction between writing and and, um, and speaking. 
there, there could be like other things, but we are like shedding lights on this stuff. Like with writing, we st should start with subject. Mm -hmm. And even we, there are like starting sentences with ands. And, and if we're trying to teach them standard writing, we, it's not preferable to use ands uh, in the first sentence. Because it's a confessional. I don't know mm. the, the intimacy of this. I think that would be something to, I know you have, you have particular goals for looking mm -hmm. at it, but I would, dive in a little bit to the right. emotions of it. Yeah, probably if you're dealing yeah. with the poem from different like, perspectives, yeah, probably. Yeah. And another thing might be in terms of um, equating um, stress timing and, and the rhythm. Mm -hmm. So it may be that uh, there are choices to have fewer syllables um, in order to fit that stress yeah, like, timing yeah. and the rhythm. And the, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. I'm wondering, kind of playing off of this idea that it's a, a kind of confessional um, I'm wondering about if you could get at some of what you're trying to get at through shifting the context a little bit as a redesign activity. Mm -hmm. um, you know, imagine uh, imagine your students into this. This is a court case where they're where one of them suing the other, and he has to explain the same set of you know, right. He cheated on her, I think. Yeah. I still, right, right. So so he's having to st to stand before the judge or write down his um, yeah. legal testimonial of yeah. how he cheated on her, so that the judge can decide if she can take all of his money. Or something uh, like that. How would the, like uh, how would the language be quite different, right? You wouldn't. You would lose the pronoun you because uh -huh. it wouldn't be addressed to her anymore. Uh -huh. You would lose a lot of the informal language. You'd lose some of the yeah. emotional language. I mean, it could be interesting to it explore the those pronouns yeah. through. Yeah. Yeah. How, yeah, we, where would we you can make a that? great deal of pragmatic play from yeah. this one. Yeah, yeah, you can. Yeah, yeah. but the, I mean, the, that redesign activity changes the pragmatic parameters. So right. You're right. It has to be formal. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Can't sing it. Yep. Okay. So I'm just having flashbacks to seventh grade. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> flashbacks to seventh grade, and and oh, so I you got cheated. I no, I didn't. No, no, no. I didn't. <laughs> but I love this song. We we used to dance to it. it you yeah. know, slow dance, and it was like ah. the serious song that everyone slow danced to. We had no idea what these lyrics meant, but it was like there was something like so. So, so emotional yeah. about it, and um, and yeah. romantic on some level, and it was so disconnected from the lyrics, you know. Like I think most seventh graders, yeah, right. You know, back. That's yeah, I'm dating funny. myself now, but I mean, it's just. <laughs> I wonder if you could get into that. Does uh, does anyone else have that connection to this song? No. <laughs> Oh, that's oh, yeah. There it goes. <laughs> <laughs> Seventh grade. Back in, back in memory. And that's recorded. Now, too. <laughs> Oh my God! Oh, it's so funny. No, no, I'm a different no. Generation, I'm, nobody's gonna admit to having that relationship. <laughs> <laughs> it's multi yeah, yeah, play. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well. You, there's a movie out that just came out. I've been talking about. It's called Eighth Grade. It's not Seventh oh, Grade, yeah. but it's yeah. close enough. Yeah. yeah. You should go see it. <laughs> <laughs> it's awkward. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Right, thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm Beth Ann Dorn from Duke University and the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And I selected this text. I came in with the idea of wanting to do something that I could immediately use within our curriculum. So the text I um, found is in the fifth unit of our textbook for Intermediate German, Stationen. The text is called Schließt euch an. Um, the great thing, though, is the lesson that I've been working on doesn't, you don't have to use it within the context of Stationen. Depending on if, let's see, you want to talk about transitions, um, cities, or um, the reunification in Germany, this would be a great lesson to use. So the lesson actually starts the night before. I have a mini homework assignment. Um, Patrick gave me this great idea to assign a YouTube video called The Calm Before the Storm. Students will watch it and then describe or make a list of adjectives that they think of when they think about the phrase, the calm before the storm. And the music video works well with this because it has a lot of muted tones. The colors are um, grays, blues, et cetera. And the, and the music itself is very calming. So with that in mind, my students will come in um, having a list of adjectives and thinking about this phrase that we are often the calm before the storm. But I want to begin our class discussion actually with the image of the city. I'm going to put this in um, presentation mode. 
So here we have um, what you would see in Germany in almost every city. And I asked the students to describe, how would you describe a city center? Of course, we'll get um, a variety of answers. It could be an American city center, which is very different from a German city center. And then moving towards the German city center, we'll have a list of phrases that we can work with um, talking about busyness, people, uh, markets, et cetera. Um, with that then, I want to come back to the phrase, the calm before the storm, and ask students, um, where have we seen this? In film, in novels, in music, et cetera. And how will we describe that within a city? Or how would you feel then if you saw that this, like a city center was empty? With that then, we transition to the text itself, which is a really interesting piece because um, it's very poetic. And it's historical, but it has a lot of language that is surprisingly um, lyrical. For example, the beginning of it said, um, in the beginning paragraph, we have uh, rumors swirl. You don't hear this often in German. So the reading process is going to be in three parts. First, students will skim the text, highlighting phrases, words they don't understand, go through it again, um, looking at what words they can actually understand because of context, and then with partners, um, discuss what remains um, unclear, and then moving forward, we'll discuss all of those things. In the chapter that this text comes up in the book, our main grammatical point is sentence structure. It's not um, anything new, it's actually a review of German sentence structure, so we break down complex and simple sentence structure. That's one of the things that I wanna discuss with the text itself. So we will talk about what words remain unclear, what phrases, um, stand out and what words seem to be um, unusual, have we never seen before. With that then, um, we'll move to the, to the grammatical. What kind of sentence structure do we see? And from that, the grammatical and the um, uh, lexical, we'll talk about this is a different kind of piece of writing that we're used to. What kind of writing could it be? Um, that said, where do you think it comes from? Would it be, and then of course students might come up with um, a novel, a film. And in our um, curriculum, by this point in the semester, students will have read two screenplays. So they will be used to that genre. The whole point of my lesson is to have genre play. Um, and with that in mind then, we talk about what are some of the genre conventions that, that could be. Um, if it's a screenplay, what, what, what might we see? If it's a novel, what might we see? And then, of course, the big reveal. It's none of those things. It's actually um, an article, a narrative essay from Spiegel, which is um, the German equivalent to Time or Newsweek. Probably better written than both of those, though. Um, with that said, then, too, we'll give a little context. It's written in 1989, right after um, the large demonstrations in Leipzig and what that might mean. Students will have been um, most likely familiar with this historical moment in Germany, especially if they've gone through our coursework at this point. Depending on how other people use it, they might have to do a little bit more introduction with this historical moment in Germany. Um, with that then, we'll talk about what this means culturally. And Spiegel is a West German um, publication. What does it mean for a reporter um, from West Germany to be in East Germany reporting on this moment of protest. Um, ultimately, I will assign the entire text. This is an excerpt. It's three pages long, and there's no way we can handle that one class period. Um, this slide uh, is a placeholder for more information about the protest itself. And then what I ultimately want them to produce is talking about their own transition, their own moment where there's calm before a storm. So the text is a description of how the city center of Leipzig empties out before this protest begins. It's eerily quiet. Nobody's in the city center, a bunch, except for some drunk people on bar stools. So, and then there's this transition, this moment of change where 50,000 people come to the middle of the city and have a peaceful um, protest and even um, police officers join in. So I want students to think then about what is a moment of change in your life, what happened right before it, and then write a short paragraph for homework that evening using um, German sentence structures. Yeah. I have a, um, a comment to 
the picture that you of the Time magazine, the one that said. Um, the one that said, um, yeah, the kinder prostitution and whatnot. Um, what are you planning on doing with that? Um, I I got a reaction. But sure. Yet, and so, like, I know nothing about German. So, um, are the students? How are you gonna play with the with the image to with that? Um, again, that's a placeholder for that particular edition. In the book, there are some other images from the essay itself, and I might use those instead. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that's provocative, and we could bring up the, the nature of the publication. What does this mean to have a, um, a picture of um, child prostitution in third world countries on the, on the front page of a, of a news magazine? What kind of readership would that um, produce and things like that? All of this to be, a, um, the other thing is the chapter before, again, going back to the context of our curriculum, we talk about media. Um, and media production in Germany. So it'd be a great way to say, what is, the, you know, what are the goals of this this uh, media outlet? Yeah. Okay, cool. And then by um, by then in your curriculum, they're already going to be aware that the that this version of the magazine is more westernized than, or is that new information? Just curiosity. You know how you were like saying. That's like, a good question. I think it it they will know it implicitly, but it will be good to bring up explicitly in class. Yeah. Okay. They may not know the, whole, the full history of it. OK, thank you. Mm -hmm. you. You mentioned that there's a lot of um, poetic usage of, of language in the original text, but mm -hmm. I'm not sh I haven't heard that you're asking your students to incorporate that in that, that kind of foregrounding of language in the redesigning task. Do you, oh, yeah. Is there any patterning? Have you been able to, to identify use? Is it just adjectival? Um, maybe they can they can create interesting combinations of adjective nouns um, in in their redesigning task. I mean, in other words, you want to incorporate some of that uh, potentially in. That's a great idea, and scaffolding that even before that task. So, if I'm having students think about some of those adjectives with the calm before the storm, what are the adjectives and the adjectival noun um, pairs right. that they could use for their own description? Yeah, that's a great point. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I really, I, I love this lesson. I have, it's also about the redesign task. I'm wondering um, if that media thread could be threaded all the way through to that as well. Oh, so yeah. imagining a context in which they're not just writing an essay, but for whom are they writing an essay? And can they also bring images and, and make it a multimodal work with layout a little bit and those other That's aspects. a great point too, yeah. Okay. So I was wondering about um, the metaphor, the calm before the storm, because when you described it, this is a, um, the, the storm to me, I was thinking of a, some cataclysmic event, mm -hmm. but actually yeah. it's a coming together of 50,000 people, but they were orderly, right? They were... Yes. Okay, that's kind of interesting. I did wrestle with the metaphor for a while, what would work best. I wanted something that would, that would um, tie in the text itself, which talks about calmness before change. Yeah. And I couldn't think of a phrase in English or even in German that would... Um, draw both of those things together. Um, but if the song that they're, they're going to be watching the night before talks about the storm as a form of change, mm -hmm. so we might be able to discuss that before talking about So then tying that into this protest, not being something that's destroying, but actually bringing about something very good. Right. Well, I mean, it, it, um, the idea of a metaphor is it's not perfect. It, it has multiple yeah. dimensions. So you you could play with that a little bit more since that is what you, and part of the redesign task, you're having them do the multi, multiple dimensions behind the metaphor itself so that um, they don't get too literal even with a metaphor, yeah. you know. Yeah, so one of the things as I'm looking at this, um, this is a, a very, I'm oh, sorry. As I'm looking at this, this text, um, and I haven't seen it in a long time, but uh, it, it's got a very clear narrative structure to it. Mm -hmm. um, it's almost like a model narrative structure, and you could really exploit that um, in the lesson because you have um, a lot of um, temporal markers of like when things happen, right? And um, and then this plötzlich, suddenly, right? That's when when it all starts and the quietness. You know, it's like the energy, and I think the word well, Spannung, even tension, right? As, um, um, uh, um, an eerie, eerie an yeah, eerie yeah. tension, right? So yeah, I think I think you could do a lot with uh, it, the genre play, right? And then 
um, with, particularly with the narrative. I think that's a great idea. I originally had, um, when we would go back to the text to talk about the, the language that stood out, highlighted each of those temporal markers um, and some of those other phrases that I found unusual, but I didn't want to lead the audience too much. But that's something that I could put, bring back in. Yeah. Great, thank you thank so much. You. Thank you.